But we do begin with this. This is who these people are. We're exposing their soul. We're, we're, we're getting to the heart of who they actually are. It's not just some manipulation. It's not entrapment. I'm not an, an agent of the government. I'm just going in as a concerned young citizen of this country, uh, just showing people what goes on behind closed doors. That was James O'Keefe about four months ago bragging on the Fox News channel about having secretly filmed employees of the community group Acorn while he pretended to be a pimp, uh, a pimp of a pretend prostitute. It was sort of an ambush action which earned Mr. O'Keefe the lavish praise of the right-wing media. Uh, it even earned him a House resolution which was authored by Republican Congressman Pete Olson. It was co-sponsored by 31 other congressional Republicans. That resolution described Mr. O'Keefe as as, quote, owed a debt of gratitude by the people of the United States. Tonight, that same James O'Keefe is facing federal felony charges for aiding and abetting an attempted wiretap of a Democratic senator. Charges that carry up to a quarter million dollar fine and 10 years in prison. The FBI complaint alleges that Mr. O'Keefe waited in the New Orleans office of Louisiana Senator Mary Landrieu yesterday morning. Mr. O'Keefe allegedly used a cell phone camera in that office to film two of his accomplices. These accomplices were dressed up as telephone repairmen. Uh, after those two fake repairmen arrived at the office, according to the complaint, they manipulated the phone system at Senator Landrieu's reception desk, and then they at least tried to do the same thing with the office's main phone system, which was located in another room in the same federal office building. The federal repair, the, excuse me, the fake repairmen were uh, Joseph Basil and Robert Flanagan. Mr. Flanagan is, interestingly enough, the son of the acting U.S. attorney in Shreveport, Louisiana. Uh, Mr. Basil, Mr. Flanagan, Mr. O'Keefe, and a fourth man named Scott Dye uh, was allegedly waiting in a getaway vehicle uh, with a listening device that could pick up transmissions. That's according to a federal law enforcement official co quoted by the Associated Press uh, tonight. Mr. Dye, again, allegedly waiting in that getaway car. Uh, Mr. O'Keefe waiting in the senator's office for the fake repairmen, and Mr. Basil and Mr. Flanagan posing as the uh, fake repairmen. Uh, all are now charged in a criminal complaint with entering federal property under false pretenses uh, for the purpose of committing a felony. Senator Landrieu late tonight released a statement about this. It said, quote, This is a very unusual situation and somewhat unsettling for me and my staff. The individuals responsible have been charged with entering federal property under false pretenses for the purposes of committing a felony. I, says the senator, am as interested as everyone else about their motives and purpose, which I hope will become clear as the investigation moves forward. Now, again, the incident and the arrests took place yesterday. The men have been arraigned in federal court, and a magistrate has set bond at $10,000 each. Mr. O'Keefe, you should know, is already the subject of lawsuits in at least two states over his allegedly illegal surreptitious filming of ACORN employees. He is a paid contributor to a right-wing Drudge Report spin-off website. He has also, of course, been a very, 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 very frequent guest on the Fox News Channel. Mr. O'Keefe appears to have been in Louisiana as recently as last week uh, in order to give a talk at the Pelican Institute, which is a Louisiana right-wing think tank. Uh, the topic of his talk, quote, exposing truth, undercover video, new media and creativity. Uh, joining us now is Alan Raymond. Mr. Raymond is the author of How to Rig an Election, Confessions of a Republican Operative. He spent three months in jail for jamming Democratic phone lines during the 2002 New Hampshire Senate race. Uh, Mr. Raymond, thanks very much for joining us tonight. Really appreciate your time. Oh, you're welcome. Thanks for having me. So uh, nobody knows what the motivations are here. Nobody's been convicted of anything, obviously. But this was a senator's office, which is why we're leading with this. What kinds of things do you think we should be looking for to figure out um, if these four arrestees are, are politically connected to anyone other than each other? Well, I think that uh, as the investigation goes forward, you keep a couple of things in mind. One is that when you have a conspiracy, and this is clearly a conspiracy, uh, the only way the conspirators walk away unscathed is if they hang together. Uh, if we don't, uh, you know, if we don't hang together, we'll hang separately. And the fact that Mr. Flanagan's father is a U.S. attorney, he's going to be lawyered up, and there's going to be a great deal of pressure put on by the FBI and these defendants. And more than likely, he's going to be the one that the FBI is able to chisel away 
uh, because he's going to be probably looking for a plea deal, not knowing all the facts, but having kind of been through this process. So I think that that's when, in the early stages, that's where you're going to see whether or not these guys break and you find out, are there other people involved? Who else knew? Is this a larger conspiracy? Or is this, uh, you know, three self-appointed uh, policemen of, uh, the, from the right-wing blogosphere who are looking to upstage their last story, which was the Acorn story? From your, again, your personal experience in dealing with the FBI in the New Hampshire Dirty Tricks case, how does that pressure manifest? Do you talk about the sort of pressure that they feel to talk about who came up with the idea for this, if anybody is directing them, if anyone, anybody is paying them, etc. How does that pressure actually manifest? What's it like to be in discussions with the FBI about that? Well, uh, they don't use a scalpel, they use a sledgehammer. And, and basically what they do is they take a look at statute and they tar start to figure out how many charges can they file against you. And so that becomes to look very overwhelming. I mean, when you look at this statute, I think you had said earlier a quarter million dollar fine and potentially 10, 10 years in prison. Uh, you know, that's not going to happen in this case. Uh, but when you're 24, um, and in Mr. O'Keefe's uh, uh, situation, you're going from icon to clown. Uh, you don't want to go from clown to convict. So there's going to be a great deal of pressure, and these guys are, are really under the gun. And unless they have, you know, $6 million for a legal defense, more than likely these guys are going to be looking to make the best deal possible for themselves and their future because that's, what it's, that's what's at stake for these guys. They're, you know, the rest of their lives, their future is on the line right here. In, in terms of what you know about... Uh dirty tricks and about the kinds of schemes for which you served time in prison uh, in New Hampshire and which you wrote your book about, does this, this sort of a scheme, this sort of a plan, what it appears to be, listening devices in a senator's phone, uh, apparently according to the Associated Press tonight, a federal law enforcement official saying a listening device in a car a couple of blocks away that could pick up transmissions from those bugs, does that sound like the kind of thing that would be part of a political dirty tricks campaign or does this sound like a freelance operation? Well, you know, there's a saying, which is, uh, don't interrupt your enemy as they're self-destructing. And by all accounts, after the Massachusetts uh, Senate special election, uh, you know, the sense on the Republican side is that the Democrats are self-destructing. So I don't think even Michael Steele's RNC would go and condone this type of thing. More, more likely, and again, the facts will, will out, more likely, you know, you're talking about guys who've ridden to notoriety and, and, and you know, great accomplishment off the acorn story. They've got to do something that, that's even better than that. And so they may, you know, being young, they may have decided, uh, hey, you know, we're, uh, we can't be touched. We're, uh, you know, we're, we're these rising stars. We're going to go make a story. And, and maybe the story has to do, maybe they, they uh, sense that there was something to have, having to do with what was called the Louisiana Purchase. It was uh, Senator Landa, Landrew's um, negotiation around Medicare payments in context of the health care vote, maybe they thought there's uh, some graft there, there's some corruption, and, and we're going to go appoint ourselves to go uncover it. Alan Raymond, uh, the author of How to Rig an Election and a Man with Unique Experience on the Manipulation of Phone Systems for Political Gain, uh, it's invaluable to us to have your insight tonight. Thanks very much for joining us. I appreciate it. Uh you're welcome. Thanks for having me. Uh, I should note one political connection here. There was, is one sort of um, strange but direct political connection tonight for these four men arrested in this case. The father of one of them, I noted, is an acting U.S. attorney in Louisiana. And th that acting U.S. attorney in Louisiana only has that job right now because Republican Senator David Vitter put a hold on the nominee to replace that U.S. attorney. So, again, we don't have any idea if connections like that um, count as political connections, that count as things that are suspicious uh, in the case of an alleged crime like this. But at this point, we know very little about the motivations uh, behind this crime and behind... Um, uh, I, I, I guess we know very little. I don't want to. I don't want to. I want to speculate here, but we know very little about what was motivating these guys, what they hoped to accomplish, um, and uh, it seems like all of the all of the uh, all of the dots that we can connect at this point may be worth connecting. I should also note the fourth suspect's name in this case. Uh, I had said earlier was Scott Dye. His first name is actually Stan, uh, and his last name is spelled D A I, which I'm only assuming is pronounced Dye. Okay.